Right. Thank you for joining us uh, this Christmas Eve. I hope you're here um, with excitement in your heart to celebrate the birth of our Savior, uh, but also your salvation. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, I began the Advent call to worship, and we discussed um, we discussed that our Savior came to brought us peace and a new hope uh, of the second Advent of Jesus Christ. Um, so we're between two Advents, right? We have the Advent that we celebrate in the birth of Christ, and then we have the second Advent, our Savior returns. And we discuss that He's enabled us to have the power within us to war against sin, to wage war daily, uh, to fight against our sin nature. And then we discuss that our Savior came as a mercy to His people. We heard through the different songs that were sang uh, in preparation and at the birth of our Savior uh, that He came as a mercy. And then He came as a covenant promise keeper, a faithful redeemer. Uh, were it not for Jesus' faithfulness, uh, we would not have our salvation. But today, on this last Advent call, I want to leave you with this truth. That Jesus came not only to do these things that we spoke of, but also to give us gifts. We celebrate Christmas with gifts, right? Sure. Yeah, we do. We do. And uh, there's no problem or issue with, with giving gifts. Um, but if we forget that Christ came himself to give us gifts, I think we miss a vital part of why we celebrate this season. We do. Listen to Ephesians 4. And he himself gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, that is, to build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, a mature person attaining to the measure of Christ's full stature. Amen. What a Savior we serve. He was born to die, but in so doing, he liberates us. We can have peace. We can fight sin. Amen. And then he comes and empowers us with the indwelling of the Spirit. And then he also gives us gifts for the church, for equipping one another, so that we can have this body, this unity, so that we can then serve the kingdom, awaiting his second advent. Uh, so this morning... I am going to do the thing that most of you always do not want, but I want to hear a response from your heart this morning. Uh, the, kids, the kids often are the ones that speak, um, and it says something to the fears that we develop as we age, right? Um, they understand that God is not something to be feared, the crowd is not something to be feared, one another is not something to be feared, they're joyful in their hearts, and so they let us know. So I challenge you this morning to speak to the response that Christ came. He came to die. He came as a baby. But then he came to enable us to have our salvation, to wage war on sin, to have peace. He came as a mercy, and he came as a promise keeper to fulfill his covenant to us. So this is what we celebrate this morning. If you came confused about what it is we celebrate, this is our Savior. This is what we celebrate. He came when we deserve nothing, but he did everything. Um, so who's going to be first to respond this Christmas season um, as an overflow of what your heart's feeling? Amen. Bring it. I will be. Yeah. Because I know that there's a lot of introverts back here. <laughs> but, um, my heart is full in three different ways by what you said. I've, as most of you know, I've recently buried my mom who lived these promises, believed these promises, and lived a faithful life all her life, 92 years. And so I'm full thinking of that. Then I'm here with all my family and Tim and I celebrated 46 years yesterday. Woo! Woo! Yeah. A few ups and downs. You may be surprised to hear that. <laughs> living with Me. Tim, <laughs> but God's faithfulness is evident in our lives by having all of our kids here with us, Whoa. except it looks like tardy Seth is not quite here yet. <laughs> <laughs> he will be, he knows he's in tardy, but you know, God's faithfulness.
faithfulness and all of our children um, have faith in Christ and married women who have faith in Christ are three beautiful granddaughters. And so I, I know we're all so happy with our family, but I'm not just saying that. I'm just talking about the ups and downs, the times when it's easy to give up, and yet the faithfulness that God gives us in our hearts to be able to um, keep following Him and then the beautiful um, rewards that He gives us. And um, so that's what I'm saying. Sure. Well done. Who else? <laughs> I'll go. Yeah. We um, we're, down, we're we're thankful for uh, his hope, his peace. Um, as Amanda's dad has dementia in the last couple of years, but Gabe and I were blessed to share Christ with him. He accepted Christ a couple of years ago, and uh, as he kind of dwindles, he always remembers Jesus. I talk to Jesus every day. I pray to Jesus every day. I remember Jesus every day. So a lot of things he doesn't remember. But he does remember Jesus. And he prays to Jesus every day. He prays with us. So we bought him a Bible last week. He reads his Bible. But he doesn't remember everything. But every time we talk to him, he's like, I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful for Jesus. So it's just the hope that he has now, even when he's dwindling in his mind. But he doesn't forget Christ. And I don't think we should forget Christ every day. I think so a lot of times I forget Christ sometimes. I'm busy. And I know I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian a long time. But his just drive to remember Christ, to pray to Christ every day, to talk to Jesus every day, it's such a it's such a reminder to me. He's been a Christian for a long time. So every time we talk to him, we get excited about the hope that he has. And one day he will celebrate with Christ without with a mind that is full. A mind full of Christ, a mind full of hope and love. So we just we're just so thankful for our Savior who saves all all people. I'm going to be uh, brief, but uh, I'm going to say a word. If you know what the word means, it's from another language. I want you to raise your hand. Mizraim. You might know that word. Mizraim. It's the word Egypt in Hebrew. Today I celebrate the fact that we have some Egyptian brothers and sisters in Christ visiting with us from Pittsburgh. <laughs> yes, and you turn around and welcome our brothers and sisters. Good morning and welcome. Because some of you are new, uh, just a bit of introduction to our speaker, but we have kids coming in just a minute under uh, his bed. Um, our speaker this morning is uh, Zachary, uh, our middle son. Uh, we have our other sons with us, of course, today. But uh, in case you don't know him, Zach grew up here, uh, born in Canada, uh, born in uh, Calgary, Alberta, and then uh, graduated from Northside from Palm Beach Atlantic University, from Dallas Seminary, and he did his PhD at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He has his wife with him today, Kayla, and our three lovely granddaughters. So after the children's presentation, he'll come up and read the scripture for us, and then he will speak, and he will pronounce the blessing as well. So when it's time for the kids to leave, would you all once again stand to your feet for the reading of the word. Now let's have Abraham was the father of Isaac and 
Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matha, and Matha the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were fourteen generations, and from David to the deportation of Babylon, fourteen generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Christ, fourteen generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and unwilling to put her, shame, put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the fact that you are a God who speaks and you have spoken. You have spoken to the prophets in many times, in many ways, but in these latter days you have spoken in a son. We thank you for speaking. We pray that you would open our ears to hear it, yes. open our eyes to see that son, and to believe in him, to trust in him with all our heart, and to live like it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, there's a strange phenomenon that happens uh, around our house this time of year. Uh, every uh, couple of weeks leading up to Christmas, uh, we get Christmas cards. And I wonder if you get the same thing, where the mailbox will all of a sudden be filled incrementally with these Christmas cards that are really pretty. And they have pictures of people that look nice. And they are well dressed. And there's decorations. And they're smiling. And they act like they love one another. And they might say something cool like, Merry and bright. And yet, all of us know, deep down, that there's something really artificial about this. There's something really kind of projected, artificial about the process of sending Christmas cards. Because I sometimes wish that instead of just getting a snapshot of a family, I could watch the, a two-minute video of everything leading up to that snapshot. <laughs> because you know that they're not smiling in those two minutes leading up to the snapshot, right? They don't have their best face on. 
The kids are probably wrangling and fighting, and they're probably pulling each other's hair. And you might even be bickering with your spouse right up to this moment where you're about to take a snapshot that's going to go up on the mantle of somebody's house. And it might take like 25 tries to get the right picture. Because if you don't look right, and this is a weird angle, and you look kind of pudgy from this direction, this isn't my best side, so we're going to take it again. Kids come back, we're going to take this one again. Kids come back, we're going to, one more try, we're going to get this thing right. And everyone knows that that's kind of the background of a Christmas card. They never go right the first time. There's something artificial about Christmas cards. Now I know that yours are not artificial. I'm just talking about my own. I know that yours are lovely, and they're great, and they're real. And I'm not, I'm not casting any doubt on yours. I'm just saying my own are a little bit like this artificial presentation. But seriously, we all know that a Christmas card is a, is a projection of who we want to be, who we want to present to the world. And so we have our smile on, we have the, the tree in the back, it's decorated. But it's not real life. It's not the whole story of our lives. It's not the whole truth. It's a moment that projects an image. Yet we love these things, and we put them up on the wall. Well, at least we do. You might just put them right, right in the trash. But I want to think about Christmas cards for a minute, because something similar is happening with the genealogy that we just read. Matthew is doing something similar to a Christmas card. And what I mean is Matthew is presenting a nice and tidy, balanced picture of the history of Israel, of everything leading up to Messiah. You'll notice that it has three sets of 14 generations. You notice how we said that in verse 17. There's 14, 14, 14. Everything's nice and tidy. You got to hear all the names that you recognize from Israel, Israelite history. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you hear about David, you hear about Josiah, Hezekiah, all the great heroes of the faith are there. But only if you squint, only if you squint do you get this really nice hallmark snapshot of a loving, wonderful family that leads up to the Messiah. Because if you look carefully, and you look at the details of this genealogy, you start to notice there's blemishes in the photograph. There's wrinkles in the fabric. There's actually a lot going on in the genealogy that if you look a little bit closer, you'll notice that things aren't quite the hallmark photograph. Things aren't quite the, the best presentation that Matthew can make of the family of Israel. So I want to draw our attention to a couple of these blemishes and ask why are they there? That's what we're going to do here for the next few minutes. I want to point attention to a few blemishes in the genealogy and then ask why are they there? Why would Matthew include them when they're apparently subverting his very intentions with this genealogy? So for one blemish, just open back up to uh, Matthew chapter 1 and look at verse 3. Okay, so verse 3, by verse 3, you've already got the pattern. Matthew has got a pattern down, right? He's got a rhythm to this genealogy. And the rhythm is really simple. It's father, son, father, son, father, son, father, son, all the way down, right? Okay, it's easy. It's just male gives birth to male, gives birth to male, gives birth to male. Except when he breaks the rhythm, he breaks the rhythm and adds in a mother. Notice how he doesn't add a mother for everybody in the list. Do you notice that? It's father, son, father, son, except for a couple of times he mentions a mother. And the first mother that we get is Tamar in verse 3. We get Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, by Tamar. Okay, now I'm not going to put your biblical knowledge to the test right now, but I wonder if you've read the story of Judah and Zerah and uh um, Tamar recently. Has anyone read that recently? Okay, we've got one guy that's gone through the life of Joseph and recently read Genesis chapter 38. Now, the circumstances surrounding the birth of uh, Perez and Zerah by Tamar are not the kind of thing you would put on a Christmas card. They're not the kind of thing that you would tell other people about. I'll give you the outline of the story very briefly. Judah one of Jacob's sons impregnates his daughter-in-law with me? His daughter-in-law when she was pretending to be a prostitute. 
Okay? All right, it's embarrassing. It's really bizarre. She pretends to be a prostitute. She dresses up like a prostitute, deceives her father-in-law into impregnating her. Okay, that's Genesis 38. I won't give you all the details. There's more details. If you want to follow it up and read it on your own time, please do so. It's very bizarre. Why does Matthew include her? He didn't have to. Remember the rhythm? Remember the structure? Male begets male begets male begets male. You don't need to mention the mother according to the structure of this genealogy. So why mention a really embarrassing, awkward moment in Israel's history? And I mean this in all seriousness. This is not the sort of thing you want to project to the world. And so if Matthew is projecting a genealogy that gives balance and order and symmetry, and makes it look like God is in control of all the happenings in Israel's history, why would you include this awkward moment of incest? Very strange. Well, it's not the only blemish. That's not the only one. The next one, you don't have to go too far to find the next one. The next one is in verse 5. Look at verse 5 very briefly. And Solomon, the father of Boaz, by uh, Rahab. There again, the rhythm has been broken. Notice, father, son, father, son, wife. Father, son, wife. Why mention Rahab? Now, we might be a little bit more familiar with Rahab. Who is Rahab? I'm going to get some audience participation here. Who is Rahab? A prostitute. A, yeah, okay. There's the prostitution thing again. Yes. So, she was, yeah, exactly. So, this is a little less cringy than Tamar, but not much better. What happens is that the Israelites are going into the Promised Land, they're on the verge of entering the Promised Land, and the first city they're going to come to is Jericho. And so they send two spies into Jericho, and the two spies find, the text is very silent here, it's very ambiguous, why do the spies end up in the house of a prostitute? That's not answered. It's left to our imagination why the spies would go into the house of a prostitute and find Rahab. But Rahab is a Canaanite prostitute. So she's the enemy, she's a foreigner, and she's a prostitute. And she finds her way into this genealogy as well. Once again, this is not the sort of thing that I would put on a Christmas card on a Hallmark presentation of our happy family. And it looks like that's what Matthew's trying to do, yet he keeps shooting himself in the foot with these weird blemishes and wrinkles in the fabric. Why well, mention Tamar and call to mind the sort of shame and the guilt of that story? Why well, mention Rahab with the similarities there with that story as well? Now let's look at one more uh, wrinkle in the story uh, where the rhythm skips a beat once again. Um, and this one is even more subtle than the others. And maybe you caught it, maybe you've seen it before, but it's in verse 6. Verse 6 says, And Jesse, the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon, here skips the beat, by the wife of Uriah. Here we have a wrinkle in the fabric. We have uh, the rhythm is skipped again. But we don't even have the woman's name mentioned. Just the wife of Uriah. And most of us are probably familiar with this story, so we don't need to go into detail. But again, the wife of Uriah was Bathsheba. And so King David one day saw Bathsheba, someone who was married, not his wife, bathing, and he was uh, compelled to go make her his own. And he did, only to find out she's pregnant, her husband is going to find out, so he murders the husband, or has the husband of Uriah uh, murdered. Now, at least there's no prostitution in that story. Right? That's a plus. We're done with it. We put that behind us. Prostitution, that's a thing of the past. But we've got adultery and murder and deception and, and conspiracy. And this is the lowest point in David's life. This is the lowest point in Psalm 51. You've read Psalm 51? That's an incident that, that is written. That's the psalm written uh, after the incident of David's confession of sin of this particular moment. And this is like the most potent, most gut-wrenching confession of sin I know of, Psalm 51. So here's the problem, and I think I've demonstrated the problem clear enough so far. From a distance, when you look at this genealogy, 
If you look from a distance, it looks balanced and ordered and symmetrical. It looks impressive. You see the kings, you see the prophets, you see the names that you recognize. You see the, the order 1414, 14, everything's leading up to Christ. Yet when you look closely, when you, you don't squint, you look closely, you look at the details, we see these blemishes that Matthew could have left out. He could have left these out. So why does he include them? It's a story, this is a family story of deception, family conflict, murder, adultery, lust, jealousy, moral failures, on and on and on. In fact, the whole structure of the genealogy reminds us of the spiral downward into rebellion and idolatry, leading up to the deportation of Babylon, the exile. It's a story of failure, of rebellion, of idolatry that doesn't end after they're exiled, even after they come back. They're still struggling with the same sins over and over again. So it's not sufficient to me to say that Matthew has constructed this genealogy simply to show you that God is in control of history. That's true. It's not sufficient to me to say that Matthew has constructed this genealogy to point to Christ. That's true. Why does he include the blemishes? Why include the wrinkles? And I, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I'll leave you in suspense no longer. I think that the answer is quite simple, and Matthew gives us the answer in verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I think that Matthew intentionally presents a complicated, subtle genealogy like this. I think he intentionally draws our attention to these blemishes and these awkward moments in the history of Israel. Why? Why would he do that? Remember, this is the best family Israel has to offer. Think about that for a moment. This is the best family Israel has to offer. Okay? This is the family of kings. This is the family of David, the Lord's anointed. This is the family of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, on and on and on. This is the best family they have to offer. Think about that. This is family number one. You've got the whole world, you've got God's chosen people, and then God's chosen family within that people. And this is what you get. That's really interesting. And what Matthew is showing us is that Israel is incapable of producing its own salvation. See what I'm saying? Israel, the best family that the world has to offer, in which God has worked the most directly and consistently, gener generation after generation, is itself incapable of saving itself. That is profound. It is. That's scary, too. Yeah. The best family that this world has to offer, the one in which God has worked the most directly and consistently throughout history, he's done miracles, he's made promises, he's made covenants with them, is itself incapable of pulling itself out of its own sin. It cannot produce just a better king, or a better prophet, or a better priest, or a better hero. The story of Israel shows that every time they produce a new one, that one fails. It's worse than the previous one. It's more mired in sin than the last one. It's a hopeless spiral down, down into sin. What Matthew's showing us is that Israel needs something, someone, from outside to come in. See what I'm saying? Matthew's showing us that the nation of Israel needs somebody to come from outside. Not within, but from outside to come in to redeem it. Because Israel can't redeem itself. It's too bogged down. It's too mired down in its own sin to pull itself out. It must have someone outside come from outside to save it, or it won't be saved. Now, that's a lie that we believe. That's a lie that we tell ourselves and we believe that we can improve over time. That as a human race, all we need to do is get together and believe in one another and stop fighting and we'll make progress. We'll develop. We'll grow. We'll improve this world. We'll make it better. We'll put away the sins of the past. We just need more education. 
We need more information. We need more communication, right? But with the onset of the internet and all the information and education you can ever get and the ability to communicate, we're worse than ever. And if you think that the 21st century is going to be better than the 20th, I, I don't know on what basis you think it will be. The history of the human race shows a constant decline in specific areas of our world. It's sad. It's terrible. And the history of Israel is a microcosm of humanity. Right? We can't look at Israel and say how bad, how awful, how idolatrous. We have to look at our own sin as well. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a fan of education. I think it's great. I think that information is great. I think progress is great. I'm not declining on those things. But I'm not a fan of self-delusion either. I'm not a fan of believing the lie that we can pull ourselves out of this mess. We just need more information, education, communication with one another. What Matthew is showing us is that just like Israel, just like the best family that Israel has, we need someone from outside to break in. And just give a moment's thought to your own personal life. I've been speaking a little bit about humanity's problem, corporately, and humanity does have a problem. The world has a problem. But think about your own personal life as well. And I'll think about my personal life as well. Have you, have you lived up to the standards of honesty and righteousness and justice, and selflessness and patience gratitude that you know in your heart are right. It's not just the world that needs saving. You do too. You personally. And me, I personally need saving from my sins. And that's the predicament that Matthew confronts us with here. In a wonderfully subtle way, I think he intentionally presents the hallmark picture with the complicated aspects to it. Have you seen those uh, pictures online where it's a it looks like a normal painting of something like a, I don't know, just like a diner or something like that. Just a normal diner scene. But the more you look, the more you see shadows and ghosts and like scary things in it. The longer you look at it, you start seeing more and more things. That's a little bit what like Matthew has done here. He's presented a, an orderly, balanced image that the closer you get, the more you realize that something sinister is happening. And so this is one of the most important aspects of Christmas, in my opinion to look squarely in the face of our own sin, both personal and corporate sin. The term incarnation is the word that we use to describe the time when someone completely other, someone from completely outside, someone set apart, someone not implicated in the sin of Adam, you get that? Someone not implicated in the guilt of Adam. Someone untouched by the selfishness, the anger, the resentment, the lust, and the greed that we swim in every day when someone else, other, became God with us. Uh, over 100 years ago, the theologian Benjamin Warfield preached a sermon with a line that always grabs me. I, I really like it. And he says, picture eternity past. Picture just before there is creation. It's just God. God alone. In his perfect blessedness, in his perfect tranquility, in the joy of the Trinity, just existing. Okay, Picture that for a moment. And he says, uh, into the immeasurable calm of the divine blessedness, Jesus Christ permitted this thought to enter. I will die for men. That always gives me chills. That always gives me chills to think in eternity past, before there was a creation, God thought, I will die for men. Then there was a moment when that happened. Why? Because we need salvation from our sins. Um, Dorothy Sayers has a great essay called The Greatest Drama Ever Staged. She says this, For whatever reason God chose to make man as he is, he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. 
Whatever game he's playing with creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. That is the outline of the official story, the tale of the time when God was the underdog and got beaten. When he submitted to the conditions he had laid down and became a man like the men he had made. And the men he made broke him and killed him. If this is dull, then what in heaven's name is worthy to be called exciting? <laughs> Last line. That man should play the tyrant over God and find him a better man than himself is an astonishing drama indeed. <laughs> Christmas, therefore, stands as a sky-high monument to the grace and the mercy of a compassionate God who is determined not to let humanity consume itself in rebellion, in corruption, in death, and sin. He is not even willing that you suffer the full consequences of your sin. And he is so determined not to let that happen that he took on flesh. The one who was entirely set apart, entirely other, the one who was perfectly blessed and happy without you existing, took on flesh to come from the outside because you are incapable. Humanity is incapable of saving itself. It's a monument. Christmas is a monument to that grace mercy and compassion. And therefore, it's also a monument to our own failure in a wonderfully ironic way. Christmas is a monument to our own failure and sin. But it's to God's glory. It's not so that we wallow in our sin, in our guilt, in our shame, but we give thanks. Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for your sakes, he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Okay. Let's bring this to a close with three very brief points of application. Okay. What can we do in response to this? First, recognize that there is room for you in the family tree. Okay. Recognize that there's space for you in the Christmas card. Okay. Sometimes we approach church, we approach religion, we approach scripture as thinking we have these saints, we have these prophets, we have these kings, and that's not who I am. That's not me. I don't fit in. I, it's just God, isn't, God doesn't work for me. Religion doesn't work for me. I've tried it. It doesn't really work for me. Well, look at the family tree of Jesus. <laughs> look who's in his Christmas card. What we've seen is just godless behavior of people without any faith at all, apparently. <laughs> Broken families, people who have wasted their lives, people who have had no interest in the things of God, people who know what God says and just do the opposite. Is that, is that anybody here this morning? <laughs> well, there's room for you in the family tree. There's room for you in the photograph. Because you don't have to hide your blemishes. You don't have to hide them. You don't have to pretend like they're not there. You fit right in with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and everyone else. So you think, I've wasted my life, wasted my time, I've made a mess. Even now, I bear the name of Christ. I'm a Christian, I go to church, and I'm just, you know, I'm living a, a double life. I'm doing something else. I, I know that there's room in my life that I need to give over to God. There's room for you, too. There's room for you too in the family tree. This is a universal call to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the wonderful thing about the gospel is it's, it's like simultaneously the most particular thing in the world and the most universal thing in the world. I don't know how that makes any sense, but it is. It's about one little young woman named Mary in a stinking stall in one little tiny backwater town at a random time in history. It's like crazy particular. And yet it's universal. Christ at the end of the book of Matthew says, all authority has been given to me, both in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey, baptizing them. And so 
there's a wonderful particularity of universality here. And there's space for you. There's room for you in the photograph, in the family tree. Okay, second. Christmas is also a time, based, based on what we see here in Matthew's genealogy, Christmas is a time that we can be honest with one another. Okay? If you can be honest about the sin in Israel's history, and you can look on that and judge that, like I've been judging it, then you can look at your own life and be honest about that. And that means having potentially awkward and difficult conversations with each other. When we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we come face to face with a depth of sin that leaves its stain on human relationships, even the best family in Israel. And that makes it harder and harder to escape the fact that when we look at our own life, even right now, even in the present, even this morning or last night, we too struggle with a depth of sin that needs forgiveness and restoration. And so if we can be honest about Israel's history, we can be honest about our own. And that means that we need to open up to those who are close with us and be honest with them about our sin. Be honest about the things that we struggle through daily, weekly, monthly. We can be honest with ourselves, with God, and those close to us. And that might mean confessing to one another. That might mean having awkward, difficult conversations about the lives that we've been living, the lies that we've been telling to one another, the things that we do in private that we don't want to admit. This is a good time to admit it. When we look at the depth of human sin and the greatness of God's forgiveness, it's a great moment. It's a great time to have that conversation. If not, when are you going to have that conversation? Third. These difficult conversations that we have, these confessions that we have with one another, are opportunities, therefore, to extend forgiveness to one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. If someone has been inspired by Matthew's genealogy to have a difficult conversation, it's a wonderful chance for you to show forgiveness and mercy and grace to them. God loves the unlovable. How can I have a higher standard than God? How can you have a higher standard than God? If someone's going to come to you with repentance, asking for forgiveness, don't hold them to a higher standard than God holds them. I can't hold my wife, my family, my kids to a higher standard than God holds them. He, he loves the unlovable. He died for the unlovable. He, he became a man for the unlovable. And so the least I can do is forgive them the small things that they've done to me. We worship a God who has already done that. We worship a God who has already loved us, already forgiven us in Jesus Christ. And so it's a small thing. It's a small thing for me to do likewise. So this Christmas holiday, think about Matthew's genealogy. Think about all the names and all the great stories that come to mind. Think about the embarrassing, awkward wrinkles in the fabric that make us kind of cringe and shudder a little bit because that's a wonderfully good thing to know. It's a wonderfully good thing to know that we can be honest about our sin. We can be honest before God and each other about our sin because His grace is greater than all of our sin. And we can give thanks that he entered into our world. Give thanks that he took our flesh for us and for our salvation. And finally, we can show gratitude. Show gratitude by forgiving one another as we've been forgiven. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we... Thank you once again for uh, the Christmas story. We pray that you would make it real to us in our lives, that we would truly understand it and be grateful for it and live in light of it. We pray, Lord, that you would bind us together as a church in harmony and in the fellowship of the gospel. We pray, Lord, for uh, family members visiting from out of town, that you would richly bless our time together. We pray for visitors who are traveling, that you would uh, send them on their way in safety. And we pray, Lord, that throughout this whole Christmas season, you would keep ever-present in our minds the true reason for the season. We thank you for Jesus Christ, his incarnation, 
and his life and death for us. We Amen. pray in his name. Amen. Amen. If anybody thinks or imagines that uh, they're religious, but they don't put a bridle on their tongue, their religion is empty. <clears throat> religion that is pure and, and faultless that our Father accepts is this, uh, to visit orphans and widows in their misfortune and to keep yourself unspotted, unpolluted from the world. I'd like to call a moratorium for the next 10 years on all entertainment and Christmas concerts for the next 10 years. And all of God's people in this country would take the Christmas season to give, to visit orphans, to visit those in prison, to visit widows, to take care of the needy who have no Christmas. Well, tomorrow, Christmas Day, if you can, if you are willing, if your schedule permits it, join us at the Carlton Manor Boys Home in Pinellas Park. Uh, we are bringing uh, a fried chicken dinner, cornbread, mac and cheese, beans and rice, and cobbler to the boys at 1 o'clock. Now the food will be cold because we, ha we have to store it here for the rest of the day. But then they're going to be heating the food up from 1 to 1.30 and we can mingle with the boys for about 20, 30 minutes. And by the time the food is ready, then it will be time for our departure and we'll sing maybe a few songs. Now remember, these are, these are boys without parents. As the little boy Sammy said to me last Tuesday, I was asking him who gave him such a wonderful name. His name is Sammy, or Samuel, which means asked of God. And he said, well, I've never had any parents. I don't know who gave me my name. And that struck a chord in me. He has no home to go to. There's none. And we could pay him a visit. We could visit this orphan in his time of distress and bring some love. It's time for the entertainment wheel to stop. And it's time for the gift giving to start. Amen? Amen. Thank you, three of you. Appreciate that. <laughs> James, give us more details on this. Come and take the microphone with you, James. And uh, let him know where to go. Scratch that. Where's the address of this place that we call the Carl Manor Boys Home? And after uh, James is done, uh, Zach will pronounce the blessing. Thank you. Uh, I don't know the address off the top of my head. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> we, we get with me. I'll get to you. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. But uh, 1 o'clock is where we're going to be visiting, as Cole said, uh, in Pinellas Park. So 30 minutes, 20 minutes. If you can come for 10 minutes, that'd be great. Um, it's, it's, more than It's like right next to the um, park, park Boulevard. Park right Boulevard, the right behind smoothie. the other tropical smoothie. Yep. Yeah. So park in that parking lot, walk over, it's right next door. 64th Street. 64th Street, yeah, right off Park Boulevard, so. I'll send out the address this afternoon on the women's text. Perfect. Yeah. Very good. One o'clock, come hang out for a little and go by the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You took my paper down. I don't know by heart. Oh, sorry. Okay, let's stand up and do the benediction. I think you'll get it on the screen. Yes, okay, good. All right. All right. Uh, glorious Father, let us be joyful and humble before all people on Christmas Day. In view of the gospel, stir us to serve the needy, comfort the grieving and the widow. Strengthen the weak, give hope to the orphan, feed the hungry, welcome the aliens and immigrants among us. And humbly share the good news of Jesus our Savior with those who are perishing. Let us all go forth with joy and sincerely carry the name of Jesus. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks to God. God. Thanks everyone, you're dismissed.